Hi, welcome to the first episode of the Robot Revolution podcast. I'm going to be your host today, Paul Estes, as we talk to Mitch Tolson, the CEO and founder of Ally Robotics. It's an honor and privilege to talk to him today because about eight months ago, I walked into a lab and saw it was a it was the first time that I saw a robot actually being made. And not only being made, but being made by someone who had a vision for the way robotics could help all industries and enhance the human experience. Before we dive in and learn more about Ally and kind of what got you started on this journey, uh, why don't you take a minute and just introduce yourself to your audience? Hey everyone, Mitch Tolson. I'm founder CEO of Ally Robotics. And uh, I'm here today to, uh, I guess, share a little bit about myself, but um, you know, we're putting together this podcast and I hope that um, I'm able to help speak with other individuals, subject matter experts, uh, potential people looking to deploy automation, synthesize their learnings, um, and, and share those experiences and learnings with all of you. And so why I'm doing this is really about, uh, I really am grounded in helping people. I started working when I was six years old. I've done it all my life, um, from sign companies to uh, designing semi-truck parts to folding motorcycles um, from the like mechanisms from clutch drive, variable clutch drive systems to folding armatures to uh, programming CNC machines uh, to designing large software systems at scale. And the thing that I've learned throughout all of these experiences is that it's it it it's again about helping people but i've i've really enjoyed the technology and engineering aspect of helping people and so when i was at a consulting company growing their robotics organization i i learned that as i was listening to all these different you know customers of ours come and pitch us their crazy ideas or fun ideas their wow this is going to hit big ideas uh, and I was helping them, um, I learned that I kind of have this knack for looking at the system lens of everything from a, from a technical aspect, pairing that with the product aspect and, and kind of just right sizing this. Um, and so, you know, where I'm at now is Ally Robotics. And I'm leading this company to develop products designed for what I call everyday automation. It's the I have a robotic arm that is for any type of application for anyone. Anyone can program this. And it really stems from when I was at Fresh Consulting and we were creating, uh, helping a company called Miso Robotics. Uh, I was helping Miso kind of de-scope and, and deliver on some of their challenges that they had, both from a software and mechanical uh, and control space. It was really about they tried all of these different off the shelf, you know, industrial robotic arms, uh, and for different reasons, they didn't work. And that's where I had pitched to, you know, Mike Bell, CEO of Miso, said, Hey, what if we developed the product that actually is more for what you need? He bought onto it. And that's where we came up with this, this concept of a robotic arm for everyday automation that means that industrial robotic arms, they're going after extreme precision that's extremely costly. Well, if I'm cooking French fries, I don't need plus or minus 0.01 millimeters of repeatability, you know, and, and so why add in that cost? And, and if I can lower the cost, I can bring this, this helpful tool to more people. I can, now it's my passion for helping people, my passion for technology and engineering, it's coming together and I can help people at scale through technology and engineering. That's a great overview in it. It's been an exciting uh, journey to be with you over the, the past uh, eight months. When you think of what's really driving the need for robotics, outside of the ones we see building Teslas and, and yeah, cars yeah. And, and that sort of stuff, what are some of the other use cases that you're hearing uh, from people that are reaching out about the Ally Arm? So I'd start, first start with what's the kind of holistic global problem? Uh, we didn't have enough babies, and so therefore we have labor shortages. And it is across all different industries. And depending on the industry, it's anywhere from 10 to 40%. Whatever that industry is, you can't find people to do these jobs. And so then it goes into where I just wrote a report um, 
it was for robotics and automation, you know, opportunities, historical 22 and looking forward. And one of the key data points they said is that 62% of all jobs out there have 30% of that job that can be automated. And I, and I look at, well, there's these industrial robotic arms. There's name your favorite company out there. And they're, they're creating a good product. They're, they're designed for what they're designed for, this very kind of constrained state space, you know, d operation in a man manufacturing floor. But what, what really inspires me is like I go back to, you know, my childhood and when I was helping my mom and her sign company and, you know, it was we, we didn't have much. Right. And it was a startup. She started out of her garage. And it was things like back then we had to like hand paint the signs, right? There wasn't this full screen printing, nothing like that. And I think back and like, it's, well, I was trying to help her because I was trying to just have enough money to put ramen on the table. Right. And then I kind of fast forward into another experience of mine. When I was 11, I started a hot dog stand and it wasn't just like any hot dog stand. I, I, sure. I made $10,000, right? Like, 11 year old like this is a, this is a legit thing because the problem was well my dad he owned the grocery store and he was the 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 it was in aberdeen washington and the there's a spotted owl and the economy started dipping he's like he had this problem of i gotta attract customers it's like hey how about i have a hot dog stand i know you know thinking about fares and stuff like that'll attract people and then so i create this hot dog stand and i saw a ton of hot dogs and then again kind of like with my mom it's like her problem was she was a single person trying to get this job done. She had all this expertise, but she had no help. And it's a you know, small to medium-sized business type of scenario. And then back at me at my hot dog stand when I was 11, I just remember like there's this lineup of people and I kept seeing people at the end of the line walk away. And I'm like stressing, I'm sweating, and I'm like trying to get the hot. I couldn't cook the hot dogs fast enough. And so now, fast forward all the way a day, I think about, well, what's the problem? The problem is the 11 year old Mitch did, didn't even know robot arms existed, you know, back then, because they did, but didn't even know existed. And then, furthermore, there was no way that I was going to be able to program this robot arm to help me cook these hot dogs. And so it's like, but if I could just have a system that anyone could program it, that I, I deploy it, I set it up, mount it on, clamp it down, and I just visually show it what I need to do, I could have made more hot dogs, had more revenue, and I would have been able to help more people. And so that's, a, that's some of the kind of, like from sign industry, we could have painted more signs, right? Because you could have taught the arm to do calligraphy. There's things like uh, where I, I know this guy, he, uh, uh, he, he has a chicken farm and the free range chickens. And he, he's like, well, the problem is I lose a lot of revenue because I don't have all my chickens don't lay eggs always in their hen in the, the little hut. So it's like have an arm to drive around and go pick up all the eggs that are loose. Right. And so it's like the point is there's this opportunity of everyday automation. It's and, and the, the challenge is the barrier to entry. It's too high. And so if we lower, lower that barrier to entry, more people can use this technology for their everyday tasks, folding laundry, uh, spraying um, uh, uh, clear coat on fi carbon fiber, you know, parts and stuff that they're making, whatever it is, uh, they can do more with less. And and coupled with the lack of resources, like the, in the labor gap, it's already hard enough to find people to do these jobs anyway, right? Yeah, I was flying through, it resonates, I was flying through Austin, um, flying to Austin uh, in the airport. And there was this dichotomy of a Starbucks line, which probably had 30 or 40 people in it. And yeah. like I said, people were walking away and they've deployed in the Austin airport, three or four of the robotic arms that make coffee. Yeah. Uh, I just, I watched some of these people who I guess had either pre-ordered or ordered at the kiosk, like get their coffee in under one minute while the rest of these people were standing in line. So there, there is this idea that technology uh, can help, you know, better, faster, cheaper, deliver uh, results, especially for businesses that are struggling, and it, whether it's structural right. or whether it's being able to find uh, labor. You, yeah. you talk a lot about lowering the barrier of entry. Yeah. And so when, when you think of the ally approach, explain to the audience who may not be familiar with, you know, the ally arm specifically, sure. what it takes today to program an arm and 
what it will take, uh, you know, ally to program on. It's yeah. I, That's a great I, I question. love the story about having your daughter, you know, be able to program it. So if you could just walk us through yeah. at a high level, why is yeah. it hard today? And then what problem are you solving there on the deployment? Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a complex answer. Um, but first it starts with a lot of industrial robotic arms today. They're deployed in a factory and they require these safety and uh, risk assessment valuations. You have to install it. You have to have these safety barriers. Um, so there's a lot of just mechanical structure um, and, you know, other implements and tool flanges and all that that have to be designed. And on top of that, now you have to have typically somebody that's um, a robot technician or a software developer come in and map out that workflow and um, write these programs either in, you know, a, a, some sort of PLC logic or uh, in, in another type of, you know, software language that then helps this robot perform that action. And for a given pick and place type of operation where you have a semi-constrained state space, it might take two software developers two weeks um, to program, you know, a kind of um, a, a, a whole cycle of emotion, like a, a pull from one place, put to another, pull from that and put it back or something like that. Um, and it's, it's all about avoiding collisions and ensuring that's a safe behavior, no singularities, all that. And so it, it, it's this huge lift. It's an, an, an order of, you know, you might pay a system integrator quarter million or, and then upwards. A lot of system integrators don't take a project until the project's over 5 million in cost, right? Um, cause it doesn't make sense for them. So that right there limits the barrier to entry, the technical barrier, but then it's also cost threshold barrier. And then there's also the one of just awareness. Like people don't know it exists, so they don't know that they can actually do this. So when I look at what we're doing in Ally, it's, it's about, I go back to all my days working as, you know, in the construction, you know, industry. And I learned a lot of trades by just looking over somebody's shoulder and saying, oh, yeah, that's how I swing the hammer and hit the nail in, you know, with the double hit or single hit um, versus like, you know, pounded a bunch. Right. And it's like, OK, well, how can I just take technology that's available today and productize that and bring it into a package that ultimately just works for people? So it's about using some AI, using some machine vision. Uh, doing some classification detection on, you know, the environment and understanding what these objects are. And, and that kind of all happens behind the scenes. And then we do some, you know, skeletal pose tracking with some reference trajectory development and micro behaviors and blah, blah, blah. We do all this stuff. And what for the, the, the end user of this, what they see is, oh, I just move my hand and I just grab this object. I pick it up. And I place it over here as like a pick and place type of operation. And all of this technology that we kind of have working behind the scenes, it's just helping facilitate an optimal set of trajectories and workflows for this person. And to the person, it just works. Now, I just visually showed, like I would show a human how to, you know, perform this operation. The arm's now repeating that similar type of operation. And so this is where like, I, you know, at Ally, we have, I have, tours almost every single week. And one of the tour aspects is, you know, we get a lot of different people, a lot of different walks of life. And, you know, I always ask them kind of the final step in the tour is, Hey, you want to program a robot arm? And they're like, Oh man, I, I can't do that. Uh, I've never touched a single line of code. No, like zero code, right? Like here, let me show you just raise your arm point and the whole arm moves on the linear rail. Um, and they're like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And so now you can start saving waypoints and now you can build an entire path and workflow. They're like, this is incredible. And so then we start to unpack, like, what are all the new type of scenarios that we can go do with this type of technology? When you look at deploying this and, and the first customer is, is MISO. And for people that aren't yeah. familiar with, with MISO, uh, they have Flippy. Uh, which is the robot that flips hamburgers, and they have uh, a robot as well that is uh, doing French fries uh, for the quick serve. Uh, Flippy Two does French fries. Flippy was the original uh, hamburger flipping. They have a they have Flippy Light that does French uh, 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 chips, 
Uh, they have some other things like Sippy that does automated drink dispensing, dispensing, and then also Cookrite to help with like coffee monitoring, uh, sure people have you know the right temperature of coffee. I want to be in the marketing team at Miso that gets the name Nick Robotics. <laughs> right. The first customer is Miso Robotics. You're solving a very specific right. customer problem. That's right. Uh, but what's next? Yeah, as we say at, at Ally, uh, certainly our partnership with Miso is is strategic and important. And the great thing is we have extreme clarity of customer and the requirements, and that helps with just development velocity, all that. But we also say is restaurants are just the beginning. And so we're using this as a way to really solve re a real problem, right? That has a lot of revenue opportunity, but then develop out this technology at the same time and then move into kind of related segments and then segments further beyond where we're starting. So things like um, if you think about we're in the food industry, so with miso, so what other type of kind of food isk type of applications can we help solve? Well, there's things like food delivery. Well, there's autonomous robots, but how does the food get into the robot? So, okay, hey, perfect. We can use a robotic arm. And if it's simple to train, people can just show the arm how to grab from a, a holding you know counter or whatever and, and load into a bag, place into the robot. And then the, that whole delivery is is more autonomous. And then as we you know, continue to develop tech, there's scenarios like, well, right now with Miso in their Flippy system, it's it, from a, from a techni technical architecture standpoint, it's basically a linear rail with a robotic arm and an implement on that arm. So imagine we take this whole solution and it's hanging upside down. It's a ceiling mount type of application. We take this whole thing, flip it upside down, 180 degrees, we put it in the bay of a quick serve, uh, uh, quick quick service, uh, a vehicle service center, right? So, uh, where instead of the the challenges, there's you know these people called grease monkeys that work underneath hot vehicles all day long, and they open up the drain plug, hot oil spills all over them. Uh, well, it's we have that same tech now to find to understand map that state space to understand the context to then find the drain plug open the drain plug drain out of the oil and and help facilitate this oil changing operation so it's these still kind of the service industry similar type of tech different type of application and then as we you know continue to build out it's now we're we're really looking at how we have improved this ability for our systems to understand the dynamic context and the intent that people want this, you know, autonomous solution to perform. So when we look at, you know, the construction industry, which is really a industry that hasn't necessarily seen a lot of innovation in the last 30 years, uh, maybe even more. And so there's a couple uh, robotics companies out there um, helping with um, wall layouts and, uh, you know, uh, drilling holes on ceilings and stuff, which is really cool. Um, but it's like there's other tasks around the construction site, such as just FOD, foreign object debris. It gets in the way. It's a, it's a huge mess. If somebody could just simply, without a you know software engineering degree, train this robot, hey, here's these things on the ground I don't want here anymore. Like, go pick them all up. That's going to open up, you know, this, this, this really, uh, there's, again, in the construction industry, over the, in 2023 alone, there's over 500,000 jobs that are going to be needed that's going to go unfilled. And so it's, it's all about creating these simple autonomous solutions that can help, you know, people come in, just anyone can train them and it performs these jobs. Uh, and then also, as we look at it, kind of a little bit more back to the food industry, agriculture, uh, picking, you know, fruits has kind of been this hard problem to solve. A lot of companies have tried to solve it. Uh, we think we've come up with some things that um, are really interesting and a little bit different approach than what others have done. And so we believe that we can help um, service a need there in the agriculture industry as well. And of course, there's some opportunity in manufacturing, but the more target is more on the kind of small to medium sized companies, 
um, that they they maybe don't have any automation today, and maybe they're not at the scale that they can you know bring in a system integrator. They just kind of need something that's you know off the shelf. <laughs> I mean, when you think about de- deploying uh, these robots, what are, what are the the things that you're hearing from uh, early customers? Uh, they're excited. They're uh, like, what is their feedback when you? you know, start saying, Hey, I think a robotic arm can, can help you. So I'd even say it's maybe a one step before that. It's really about, well, I don't, the, the, their response might be, well, I don't think a robot arm can solve my problem. And then, you know, you start to unpack, well, why? Well, robotic arms have been around for 40, almost 50 years now. Like it, they've been around a long time. So people have developed these expectations of what they are and what they are not. And so they might say, oh, well, you know, um, I can't have a robot arm because they have this massive control box and I am in a mobile type of application or uh, I don't have the power requirements to be able to support this, right? And so when you think about these systems for looking at scale and, and what people need, it's really about um, a solution that oftentimes is about how does it have a smaller footprint? How can I easily program and train it? How can I afford this thing? And then when it breaks, like what what happens when it breaks? I, I don't know how to repair this. And I can't afford, like if I if I if the system goes down, I can't afford whatever my operation is to not get done, right? And so at Ally, we're thinking about like, you know, maintainability, serviceability, ease of training, simplification of deployment. Um, smaller footprint uh, and just, you know, overall just a performance of I can run my full payload at full velocity at full arm reach. A lot of arm robot arms can't do that. But it's really just going back to when I'm having these conversations with people, it's listening to what their needs are. They need things that the specs have to be simple and they need to be presented in a way that they can understand and then relate it back to whatever their problem that they're trying to solve. How do you see Ally being able to integrate with other robotics companies? Yeah, there's a couple different aspects to this. Uh, I, I think about it first from a an alignment standpoint on what's the application, how we're trying to solve this, um, and what technology exists to solve it. So first, I'm not in the mindset that we, Ally, have to solve all of the discrete problems to deliver end value to... Uh, that customer. I instead believe that I think we as technology companies should rally together to bring together our our technology into a single solution that solves these needs for customers because that's what they just want. They just want stuff to work. And so I think it's first that alignment overall in, in the approach. The second is uh, when I, I'm a mechanical guy, right? So I think about what are the hardware interfaces of the system? Like and so we've ensured that we're conforming to a lot of standards. And as so long as other companies are conforming to the same standards, there's natural form fit function interfaces that allow for any type of robot arm implement to be able to attach to our arm. And, and we're ensuring a wide range of compatibility. And then the other aspect, though, is more on the software space. It's It's really about what we're building is this, this platform and, and an ecosystem for other companies to come and join us and, uh, and, and we can host them because our robot arm, unlike any other robotic arm, uh, is uh, designed with the hardware in the box to run AI algorithms um, and different uh, you know, models right there on box. Uh, we don't need some, you know, we don't need to shuttle workloads to the cloud or anything like that. Um, and so what that does, is it allows us for, to host a lot of applications with a, without additional hardware that otherwise robot arms couldn't do. And so people can come in and we can host their containerized services directly on our arm. And then we create those, you know, semantic interfaces between other systems that are connected to our arm uh, and what they're bringing. So maybe they have some 
unique classification algorithms or something that understands, you know, if somebody walked into a scene and how you respond in a safety critical type of, you know, response or, or, or set of events. Um, and then that, you know, can then tell these other systems how, how to respond to that, shut down or, or operate in a, in a slower, you know, movement rate or whatever. Um, and it's, it's, so it's, it's really this kind of like overall alignment, but then hardware, software alignment that, that we welcome people to uh, come and join us. And so that's where to start, we have uh, created an early access program. And that's where we're looking for uh, either, uh, it could be a range of different things, but it's either companies that have a clear customer and they need some help to bring together a complete automation solution. Um, to give you an example, uh, there's somebody that is looks like joining our EAP right now that they're doing pepper picking. Um, and so they have a very unique kind of end effector, but what they don't have is the robot arm. And what their customer needs is the whole solution just to work. So we're, you know, we're, we're taking them as an early access program member um, and we'll help kind of go with them to help solve this customer problem. And we're looking for other scenarios that are for a, a more high volume application. Uh, so maybe in the shipping logistics package uh, environment where current solutions aren't quite solving the problems that are needed like non-conveyable packages and things like that uh, to um, really just anything that somebody says, hey, here's a problem that uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity here and uh, we need some help to help design the solution to, to solve these customer problems. And so we encourage you to reach out to us. We're happy to talk with you and help scope it. Um, and then we can work from there. When you, this is my, my last question is when yeah. you look at five years in the future, seven sure. years in the future, what will it take to bring these lower costs, easier to service, smaller footprint arms, easier to program uh, to the masses to, to make it, you know, something that, that is approachable by everyone? So, and the other aspect of bringing this to the masses is about, um, helping people, I would call it just have the confidence that, you know, they can do this, right? So, uh, you know, there's a day to use kind of analogy of, um, uh, 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 you know, we used to build houses and we'd frame houses with just a static hammer, right? And then all of a sudden we came in with, you know, automatic nailers and, it's a more complex system. What do you mean I have to have a compressor and, you know, all this other stuff and this hose and it was new, right? And it was different. But man, once people learned how to use this kind of new tech, I mean, you can, you can frame a house in one to two days, depending on the size of the house, a little longer if it's really large, but um, it, it's about helping kind of educate them on this capability. And then it's not like if, if you give a framer, you know, your, your standard hammer or a nailer, they're going to pick the, the, the auto nailer as most for most operations. Sometimes they'll pick up their standard hammer and, you know, nail on a couple of nails that get, didn't get in all the way, but it's about giving that confidence that these, these things, they're, they're not here to take jobs or they're, they're to help us do work more efficiently. So we don't have to, you know, do work that's in this kind of hazardous type of environments. Like I know somebody that they do, uh, they make Christmas ornaments. And the silvering process of Christmas ornaments, pouring the silver powder and you have to bake it. And it's, it's a corrosive, toxic type of task. Well, the problem with there is that, and this kind of speaks to the whole masses is the problem that this, you know, small business has is that they don't have any type of technology employed within their, you know, automation today, their, their factory today. Um, and because of that, that technological barrier, but if the, the barrier is such that, oh, I can just show this technology just as though I would teach an, another human to do this task. Oh, wait, now I can bring in this automation. Kind of like the nailer, right? It's like you just show them and it's like, okay, I can kind of understand how this works, right? And then they're, they're kind of autonomous from there and start using it. Um, and then kind of the third thing is about, I, I really believe that there's this element of supply chain. So 
um, to get to the masses, you really have to, from a core engineering standpoint, look at how your design is brought together so that it's not just, you know, low cost, but it's about how am I sourcing my materials? What type of materials? What's, what's the overall, like when I assemble up these materials, what's the manufacturing time to do that assembly? But then what's the, the challenges on the test side and release side and maintenance side, right? If, 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 if these things, we, we develop cheap, low cost automation that then we deploy it and it breaks for from deploying at the massive scale people have this reaction that oh well i can't rely on it to do my job so i just have to go find somebody and i can't find anyone to hire anyway so now i have a problem but if they can trust that it just works or that you know they can come in and and it's easy to repair that that end person there can repair it just like replacing batteries in your flashlight as easy it is to bring your flashlight, you know, back online, right? Like these autonomous things, you can do the same. Then I think that would really help the scaled adoption. Thanks Mr. for sharing just the journey of, of ally and yeah. your background, which is, is fascinating how you're able to bring um, so many different aspects everywhere from the, the sign making to the hot dog stand um, to, I know your, your passion of, of doing robotic competitions and, and yeah. things like that. And so, uh, it's a, a fascinating company and approach, and you have a, a pretty clear vision on uh, where robotics and automation uh, can be helpful. As, as the podcast goes on and people continue to listen, who are some of the guests uh, that you're excited about and things or things that you, you hope that people can take away? Great question. Um, so not to name any specific people, but in general, uh, I really am grounded in this this aspect of I think too many robot companies have just focused on creating cool tech for tech's sake. And I really think that there's, I think there's a shift in people starting to gravitate. Okay. We got to solve some real problems. Excellent. Great. So in that same vein, I, I truly believe we have to solve real problems, do less R and D and just productize the technology we already have. So there's this aspect of, I want to go talk to potential customers these small, medium-sized business owners and the like that, you know, they have these kind of real working needs and just kind of expose that and up-level them and give them a voice, a platform to say, hey, I have this problem. Somebody please help me, right? Um, I, and I think that will really help, again, deployment at scale, right? Like more people trying to solve problems that people actually care about, right? Um then I also want to talk to a lot of people that are, you know, have been in the industry for a long time and, and they, they, they know what works, they know what doesn't work from a technology standpoint and try to unpack this, this kind of sliding spectrum of there's the, you know, bleeding edge, you know, research and it's, it's far away from productization all the way to like, what's the kind of bread and butter I can just cookie cutter deploy this and it'll work. Right. And, and find that kind of right balance and within that spectrum of um, what's ready to bring to the market. And then, then kind of last one is talking to people that are um, actually doing this, right? Companies, owners of companies, um, you know, CTOs, I want to dig into the tech, right? And, and unpack, like, what's their key learnings? What, why did that not work, right? And, and dig in there um, and hear from them firsthand to help those that are maybe somebody is passionate about you know solving problems with technology uh and help them give some hey if you want to start a startup here's the things from the business side of things from the product listening to the customer specking this out the right solution right amount of scope don't try to take on too much to here's the tech tech that you should look at and avoid this other tech even though it sounds really cool and you know the problems you're trying to solve all along that um, and I, I hope kind of the key takeaways are that people come across, they'll, they'll take away specifically what other industry experts are talking about um, within their, their specific area of expertise, um, what customers are needing, right? What's that opportunity and unpacking it more? Um, and then kind of where we can go from here, right? What's kind of the trends? Uh, it's, you know, if, if there's something bleeding edge, but it's very promising, how can we maybe accelerate and create some energy around that to, you know, help it 
move through that uh, development cycles, the R&D cycles, to, to get it out to and solve these problems that people have. Well, I'm looking forward to learning more about the democratization of uh, robotics and, and automation. Uh, I, I know some of the upcoming guests, so I'm, I'm excited and I hope people uh, tune in uh, to future episodes and, and are able to take away uh, some learnings about where technology is going and, and how it can help businesses of all industries uh, and scale. So thank you so much for your time today, Mitch. Uh, and thank you, listener, for taking time to listen to the first edition of the Robotic Revolution podcast. Thank you, everyone.